these bear, some of the sounds they make can be dragon-like. <laughs> If you're gonna kill a big old boar, bush dragon describes that thing. You'll hear the sound, you'll see the, the bush move, and then here comes a giant boar, bush dragon. kill some bear. We just have about a week of travel to get there and hopefully passport success. We might be back here tonight. <laughs> Rough plan is take off at 5 a.m. at Eugene, get to Denver. Then we have about uh, almost, I think 11 hours in Denver to go Derek hooked us up with the Denver Broncos somehow to, uh, and the mayor of Denver and the, talked to a senator maybe anyway to rush our passport process. So we have 11 hours to get that figured out and then on to Edmonton. Get there tonight, drive a few hours, maybe three hours, and then get to bear camp late tonight. Sounds easy. Yeah, sounds fun. So four hours later, we got the passport, we're going bear hunting. Thank goodness. Even if I'm burning in the sands, I'm walking in my path. Taking all the happiness that bleeds when I dance. My matter is obtained by the land. Laughing at the masses, shake their hand. Sweaty palms, arms shaking what a man. Took a little while to get here. Got here at 9.30 or 10. Now it's 11.28. Getting close to 24 hours of, <laughs> I guess, making this happen, but we're finally in Edmonton. They're gonna be bear hunting tomorrow, so that's a recap of the day. Not a hard day, like physically, but a grind. But we're here, let's kill some bear. Right from the get-go of our bow hunting journey, Roy and I were pretty obsessed, not just with bow hunting, but with bow hunting black bear. It just seemed like, for us, for small town bow hunters, like hunting a bear with a bow was, was exciting, it was challenging, it was something we quickly became infatuated with, and especially in the spring. We'd go and we'd shoot carp for bear bait, and then take the carp, set up bear base, and just was checking those nonstop. When we were supposed to be working for his construction company, we'd work really hard in the morning, then take off and go bear baiting every day. Roy started bow hunting the year before me, so he started in 88, I started in 89. And just like that one year, advantage and experience that Roy had on me, he had the advantage in hunting pretty much the whole time. Along the way of hunting together for you know decades, I learned a ton, but a lot of it was you know following his lead. I just fell in love with what he fell in love with and it was hunting big bear. And you know we'd go to what we thought was the best bear hunting country there was and he would always kill a bigger one than me. He would, I'd always kill a pretty good bear, then he'd always kill a giant. So it was, uh, everything worked out like it was supposed to. Back in the day, I'd call him the hunting guru. And that was before we even hunted together because that was his reputation at school. And uh, 
you know, he stayed true to that till the bitter end. I mean, he, uh, he was always the man. Learned a lot from him. You hit him good. Cameron's gonna be pissed. <laughs>
like what people may imagine. It's uh, there's a science to baiting and doing it right, and the only way you're gonna kill big male bear on a regular basis is by having credence to that science. Another key aspect to successful baiting is having a beaver. Beavers take the bait to a whole nother level. If you have a beaver hanging, which is a whole nother part of the process for the rivets is getting fresh beaver or, or beaver that they can freeze and use as bait. For whatever reason, they're obsessed with getting that beaver before anything else. You could have anything else out there. You could have the, what we think a bear would like is their favorite food. They'll go right for that rotten beaver. It was a kind of a shitty day to hunt. Windy, rainy, terrible bear movement day. They don't like coming into baits when everything's moving all around and they can't use their nose because um, it's too windy. So tomorrow's supposed to improve. Kind of got our feet wet today and uh, saw some bear. So tomorrow's gonna be great. Can't wait. When I get to camp, wherever I'm going, I'm gonna shoot my bow. Every time, make sure the travel went good, everything's working like it's supposed to. I always shoot my bow and I always have. For over 30 years now, when I get to camp, I shoot my bow. And then also, if it's I'm hunting a, a stand, I'm gonna shoot a practice arrow out of that stand. I'm gonna see what it's like, I'm gonna see what it feels like. There's a million different things that you deal with on a shot that you might not have thought about. And you don't want to be, you don't want those to crop up when a bear's standing there and you're at full draw and then you see that, oh, there's some brush in the way that's gonna deflect an arrow. So I always make sure I do a practice shot at the bait. It gives me a lot of confidence. Make sure my bow got out there in one piece. It's not just, here's what you should do, but I have proof on why it works, so yeah take the extra steps to make sure your equipment's working like it's supposed to, make sure when you're in the blind that arrow's flying like it's supposed to, and then be very disciplined on making a perfect shot and get offering that bear a merciful death. My thing is, is I talk shit regardless of outcome. <laughs> yeah. That's good. That's good. Does that usually go well? Talking shit regardless of outcome? Yeah. Yeah, because it makes me look cool in the moment. Yeah. Then just cut out. A moment the later, we just edit that shit out. Yeah. No, it doesn't always work in my favor. <laughs> Best arrow That's gets what? a wolf. What? <laughs> you make the rules up after I shoot. Is it really gonna matter, though? Yeah. Bitch, watch this. <laughs> I don't really think it matters. I mean, you have to shoot that fucking thing at that target. Yeah. yeah. You'll never get it out. It is kind of like a field point though, I think you're right. The wrong target? <laughs> hey, this is, let's just get it out. What target were you shooting at? The, the one you hit. The left one. Okay, well you hit the right one. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. You're not getting it out of that. 
because then I was like, oh, well, maybe you shoot it at the other target. No, you hit the, the one on the right. <laughs> and you're definitely not getting it out. Why do you, why do you always have to be so negative? <laughs> which, which spot? The center. Just making sure. Fuck. That's going to be tough. You can't see me. <laughs> I mean, it is a little left. <laughs> what? Yeah. Isn't it? I don't know. You got to do something special. You got to keep hammering to beat this shot. Oh. Shit. We might have a tie. From center. Do you take left or low? I take low. Low is always better than left. You got shoulder blade. <laughs> shoulder blade? I'm yeah. a quarter inch heart. off. No, I got heart. You just caught the shoulder blade. Shoulder. <laughs> so I beat you, out. right? No, you hit the shoulder blade. No, dude, you're low. Heart. You got brisket. Heart. You brisket. <laughs> Roy was obsessed with giant bear, so we'd go to Prince of Wales, Alaska, because rumor has it, that's where the biggest bear were. Not the best coats, but the biggest heads. And so we were, we were obsessed with that. We went there for many years. And in that location, a big bear would come in and he'd take over the bait and no other bear would come in. Um, that would just, he'd just be the dominant boar. And that one big drainage and he'd come down to the water and then we'd have the bait up off the water a bit, but he would own that whole drainage. Um, and then up in Alberta, there's just so many bear, it's insane. I mean, I've, I've seen 10 bear in a night and there's been seasons back in Oregon when I first started where I wouldn't see 10 bear all season. So it's, uh, it's definitely bear way more plentiful up there, but it just, it just goes to show how much hunters still need to to play a part in that ecosystem up there because if we're not killing, you know, the limit is two bear a year up in Alberta. If we're not killing those, then the moose calves just get hammered. So a bear the size of the bear you killed is like a tyrant. Yeah. Right? He kills all the babies. Mm -hmm. He kills whatever he can get a hold of. He, he kills younger bears. They cannibalize. Right. They That's what's... Emphasized. Yeah, there's so much of that that they... Well, and cannibalize. Like if, right. if, if a bear gets shot by a hunter and you get to it, it there's a possibility that other bears are eating it already. Right. Yeah, like that happens. A real good possibility. That happens often. That happens often. If you have to leave it overnight, yes. there's a chance it's going to be eaten. Which is fucking wild. Mm -hmm. But that's the world. It's not a world of yogi. No. And this is a crazy idea of this animal that people have, which is make would uh, makes people take selfies with them and do all this crazy shit that they do at like Yellowstone, those wackadoos that get in front of bison. It's like we have these ideas about what these things are that's right. based on a bullshit version of them, including right. the Yellowstone version. As many bear as there are up there, they can have a drastically negative effect on the moose calves and then a lot of white tail up up there so they'll kill the the deer fawns also so it's just uh, kind of adjusting just like any other hunt you know you go from oregon certain number of barrier hunting and, and you have actions that that allow you to be successful in that circumstance then you go to alaska it's a little bit different you tweak it just like we learn when we hunt we have to change our tactics we learn along the way and now in alberta it's kind of evolved and with john and jen rivet up there they've been very supportive of how I like to hunt and they have, you know, decades of experience. So I respect them too, but man, as a team, we've been, it's, we've been on a good run.
where I was just we're bear hunting last week in Alberta, these bear come in, and it was it was funny because the sows would come in, and they would just be growling, fighting, doing the alarm call, getting all puffed up, it, and I'm like, why would you be so mad at somebody you live with every day, right? Yeah. But they're just they are just so competitive. And then the males come in in his breeding season. It was pretty fascinating because you wouldn't even see them. And the bear would all be looking up the other bear, the smaller bear, the smaller boars or the south. They'd be looking towards where he's coming and then he'd show up. I, I remember back, I saw a sow and she was like walking and like kind of doing like this, like really hard steps. And I'm like, are they feeling that vibration of a heavy anim a heavier animal coming? Wow. A bigger boar. They have that much sensitivity. I think. Ground. I bet it makes sense. Because I saw the smaller sow like trying to stomp. Mm. And I'm like, it, it just makes sense that that what was going on because they knew that the bear I killed was coming long before they could see him. Mine's uh, consistently to the left, but it's dead center. Is it? It's to four inches to the left. Nice. That's good shooting. I don't know what's up with this a little, a little bit off, a little bit lefty. Oh, <laughs> dead center! <laughs> Bitch, we can stop shooting now. That's what we do. <laughs> hey, that practice actually worked, eh? <laughs> the next surprise. You really I good. always act surprised when I hit a target at 100. <laughs> so a word of advice for all those little kitties out there that want to keep hammering. Shoot like him. So we're way back in the bush. We're going to a bait that's never been hunted. You always think that it could be the biggest bear ever because it's never been hunted. So there's uh, these bear back here. Because it's so vast, they just they get old, and that's what we want. Big old, big old boar. You get to a bait and you see poop like this. Brand new bears, I've never been here. No, where else did Mio, what's in there? No, no. It's got the rut zone, and there's bears moving in and out of here. Big trails everywhere. It's gonna get this brushed in a little bit, but it's got a good background already. I mean, it's pretty thick right there, so they'll be looking here. They won't be able to see us. In Oregon here, Roy and I had, I guess, through from 89 to 94, where we were hunting deer, elk, bear. In 94, they outlawed bear baiting and running dogs. So we didn't really run dogs to, to get bear or lions, but we definitely bear baited. So after 94, by and large, we were pretty much done here in Oregon baiting-wise. Then we went to Alaska and we came up with something called bear crack. And this was just a, a little mixture. A lot of people do honey burns, but we we really put some thought into it. So we would have honey, marshmallows, marshmallows and jello. jello. And you see the uh, smoke and the scent wafting off through the trees. Sometimes a bear come back in here when we're cooking this up, they can't wait. We'd also fry bacon and then we'd fry bacon and dip it in the Jello bear crack. So we'd have candied bacon, which I actually ate some of it myself when we were up there. It was so, tasted so good. But those bear, that, I mean, they couldn't take it. And sometimes I'd be cooking bear crack and they'd be like right here, just like, okay, you need to get out of here. I need to eat that. But in Alberta, because there's so many bear, it's, pretty intense to try to cook bear crack up there because there's too many bear and they'll just come in and they'll just, they might try to take it right out of your hand. So it's a little risky to do that. So we haven't even really been doing bear crack since I've been hunting Alberta. Started it when I first went up there, but then now it's evolved and got a system and it's not really necessary now. One of the 
best parts of sitting bait, especially in a very active area like we are up in Alberta on that crown land, is uh, just the interactions between not only us as humans there, but bear amongst themselves. They are very competitive. They communicate much more than you'd think. I mean, not only just in body language, because that's how most animals communicate is body language. You know, whether, how they're facing, how they're looking, how they're walking. That's all sending a message to the other animals. The sounds they make, like the, the aggressive type sounds, they'll get hunched up and they'll kind of be uh, growling and barking at each other. If you weren't sitting there watching them, you'd wonder what, where in the heck is this noise coming from? It sounds, it can be pretty haunting, but when you're watching them, it's very special. Bear can go from being aggressive with each other to walking right over to if I'm sitting on the ground, right over to me. And at that time you're wondering, see, it was just fighting a bear or getting ready to fight a bear. Now it walked over to me. What's it thinking? Did it think that it got disrespected or run off by an aggressive bear? So now it wants to take out that aggression on something smaller than it, me sitting there on the ground. There's always that kind of fascinating interaction between bear and bear and hunter and bear that uh, I cherish. I love those moments. I love just being that closely involved in wild animals, especially black bear. They're, they're, uh, they're pretty special. I was thinking, you know, they were almost fought. That I'm like, is she just pissed and now gonna... She's coming to pick on something. Yeah, that she could beat up. Just keep recording. <laughs> you can read a bear, you can read a bear's body language, just like anything else. You know, there's bear that came up that I didn't even really lean forward, I wasn't even worried about, and they were feet away. Um, because you can tell, it's, I mean, I'm not saying that a wild animal can't snap and maybe catch you off guard, but I think you can read an animal. There was a bear that had kind of looking, you know, side eyes and kind of kind of doing like this back and forth just staring at you moving his head but keeping its eyes locked on you just waiting for one slip up to where it could react but i had my knife and i was like no and just no like that and that is way different than if i would have been panicking backing up two completely different scenarios panicking backing up might have led to a charge. Me being aggressive, well, of course, you don't know what they're gonna do, but in my experience, if you're confident looking down and saying no, it dissolves the situation. But I'm not saying I could never screw that up and read it wrong, but that's usually what I do, and um, it's worked out pretty well. Um, haven't got torn up yet. When the target bear comes in, like this season, it was the, you know, seven foot, six inch bear came in, big, big male, it's the only bear I wanted to kill that we saw. 
We had, I think, one trail cam picture of him. They had never sat there. But when he came in, then I'm focused on, I just got to make a good shot. I got, I can't force it. I've seen Bear take what you think is a good hit and shrug it off. If you don't get a perfect arrow in him, it's gonna be a long day. With that giant bear that came in, I wanted to get an arrow in him. I wanted to in the worst way, but I've learned that lesson before of forcing things. And there's a fine line between being aggressive and being smart. And I was dancing around it. I'm only taking a broadside or quarter and away shot. I'm not forcing anything. It can be very tempting because those bears are so close, 10, 15 yards at times, standing up. You know, the 3D targets have bears standing up, so you practice those all the time. You, you kind of think you're better than you are, maybe. And then I found that when a bear stands up, its vitals, I think, hang a little differently, so its lungs might be a little longer and thinner than they normally would if they're attached to the top of the at the top of the chest cavity and they're hanging down. I think that's a wider target than as opposed to if they're standing up. When the bear would leave, when he'd come in and I didn't shoot, I'd second guess myself. There's no guarantee he's coming back. So I thought, was that my chance that I just blow it? And for a while, I thought I did. I mean, he disappeared for a while and I'm like, how did I have this bear 15 yards and I you know, couldn't get an arrow in him? I have a lot of respect for an animal that's been around and, and survived in the woods that long. So I don't want to disrespect how hard he's worked to survive for so many years by making a poor shot on them. There's a lot that goes on, both physically and mentally, when you have a bear close and he's all sorts of different directions, always moving, chasing off other bear, and you're sitting there trying to, to bring down a monster bear with one arrow. It's, uh, it's gotta be perfect. If I'm killing an animal, it, I have a connection with it. Just like the Native Americans, they'd have different interpretations of counting coup. Back in the day, that would be like if they put themselves in great danger, 
survived. They could have killed another warrior they were fighting, but instead touched him or stole his horses. If they got injured, they put a red feather or a feather dipped in red on their staff. If they counted coup and got away, they put a clean feather on their staff and that's just what they did. For me, counting coup is, if I'm gonna kill that animal, I have a special reverence to that animal if I'm there when it dies. I wanted to get to him before he died and tell him thank you um, and tell him it's okay to go. I never check to see if somebody's coming with me, if somebody's got a gun, if somebody's got a camera. I don't care about any of that. This is between me and the bear. I'm killing the bear. I'm going to be there when he goes. And if I get there too early and he attacks me, This way it goes. I mean, I'm trying to kill him. If he kills me, that's, you know, it's fair play. I don't see anybody understanding that. But at, at the same token, I guess the Native Americans, when they would do it, did somebody have to understand what they were doing? Did they have to explain it? Did they have to justify it? To me, it's just a powerful moment. Hunting to me is, it's who I am. I'm a bow hunter. And um, when I kill a bear, there's something, there's a deep connection with killing, killing a bear. And I want to, I just want to, I just want to respect that process and respect the moment of his life leaving. I did it. I'm telling him I'm sorry. And it's powerful. Man, he looks big right there. He went further than I was. Normally they don't go that far. It's like tonight, absolutely live for it. Guys like this. <laughs> seven, four and a quarter? Yeah. So seven, four and seven, eight. Yeah. So, so, so seven, seven six, six square. square. That's a big bear. Not bad. Yeah. Twelve and three eighths, seven and one eighth. Yeah. Nineteen and four eighths. Nineteen and four eighths. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's a great freaking bear. I don't think people realize how good bear meat is. In fact, I saw. There was another outfitter that commented on my social media page and said that he's had, I don't know how many clients, but not one of them has taken the bear meat home. So he was questioning whether I really did. Well, my answer to him was, you've never taken me. If I kill it, I'm gonna eat it. And the bear up in Alberta, no different. We took care of that meat, stayed up that night, skinned out the hide, got the meat off, the back straps, the, the back hams, the front quarters, the neck meat, everything. Took it, packed it in ice, checked it in his luggage, flew it home, had to pay, I think like 600 bucks to get two, two coolers home of 147 pounds of bear meat. And took it to Gates Family Tradition Meats here that does some of my wild game processing to have them make um, summer sausage and pepperoni. Right Dude, here. we're eating bear Dude. pepperoni. It's delicious. It's so very, good. very good. That is so good, and that's yeah. bear. And oh, people yeah. are like, oh, you can eat bear? Summer sausage. I've had bear summer sausage. It's delicious. It's, uh, 
it's no different than if I kill a deer or elk, it's going to come home to my freezer and it's going to fuel me. Say something just smart and really... Um, um, Intelligent? Yeah. Okay, uh, pi r squared equals... Um, <laughs> a lot of smart stuff to say. <laughs> that didn't sound so smart. That didn't sound very smart, did it? No. <laughs> Roy and I were addicted to the biggest adventures for the biggest animals that we knew of. If it took great effort to get there, and it was gonna be like, well, we'd think the promised land for that, whatever species we we're hunting, there'd be nothing we couldn't overcome to get there. And so that always drove us. It always drove us, the biggest adventures, the biggest animals, the craziest stories, we loved it. And um, that's all I'm still trying to do while at the same time respecting the animals I pursue. We want a story, we want to come back. And to me, life is all about the stories you can tell. And when I go on a hunt, when Roy and I would go on a hunt, we'd come back, we'd have a story. Life without great adventure, without the unknown, without pursuing these incredible animals and, and rugged and unforgiving country, is what what is it's just existence it's uh it's a muted form of life it's watered down it's safe and that's not that's not what i'm after i'm not after just going through the motions i'm after big adventure and big country doing amazing things with cool people and and um that's never going to change I took a good, good brewing that's probably a potential Boone and Crockett and Jim right through the heart of a just a gorgeous pelted black bear. It's uh, pretty, pretty exciting. Um, just had a, been having a fantastic, fantastic hunt with great weather and good company. It's been, been a real good time. Mm -hmm.